The Cutie Honey franchise spans over many mediums, such as manga, live action adaptations, stage plays, OVA series, and anime across decades. But what sets Cutie Honey apart from the traditional Magical Girl series of its time? And what made this series so popular with young audiences? And what connections and influences has this series left in the realm of anime? And lastly, because I know I'm asking a lot of questions, what was Go Nagai's impact on the anime industry as a whole? Welcome to the Nerdy Magical Girl podcast. And today we are doing a deep dive into Cutie Honey. Created in 1973, Cutie Honey was a shonen magical girl manga series that heavily focused on fan service. The story focuses on Honey Kisaragi, who is a 16-year-old Catholic schoolgirl who also happens to be an android, who was created by Dr. Kisaragi. Honey Kisaragi transforms into the busty Cutie Honey, and Cutie Honey fights against the villains that threaten her friends, her family, and the world, with the staple of the character being the transformation sequence, which involves the temporary loss of all of her clothing when changing from Honey Kisaragi into Cutie Honey. The series was written and illustrated by Go Nagai, who also credited Cutie Honey as being the first female protagonist of a shonen manga series and anime. In the 1970s, the magical girl genre Genre was growing in popularity and pushing boundaries of what can be done within the genre creatively. During the 60s and 70s, the magical girl genre of manga and anime was heavily dominated by male creatives due to the smooth entry point it provided them in order to get into the manga industry, and also due to the heavy sexist norms that left women out of certain careers. But more on that later. Hane Kisaragi's personality is very bold, but mischievous. She is known for mocking her enemies mid combat along with making fun of her guy friends. When transforming into Cutie Honey, she can transform into one of six forms. Hurricane Honey, a biker when the situation necessitates a quick escape. Misty Honey, a singer who uses a microphone as a weapon. And yes, in some renditions, Misty Honey does appear with a darker skin tone. Idol Honey, who is a flight attendant slash stewardess. Flash Honey, a reporter who uses her camera to blind opponents. Fancy Honey, who is a model who uses a long stick cigar as a weapon, and Cutie Honey, the pink-haired warrior of love who uses a sword. Cutie Honey's enemies are the Panther Claws, a criminal organization composed of majority women whose goal is to create a similar device that Honey wears that allows her to transform and create clothes and weapons out of thin air. Now, with all of that background with Cutie Honey, the story, and some of the characters that are pertinent to the plot, if it seems like in this deep dive I'm not going too much into the plots of each rendition of Cutie Honey, that's because sometimes a lot of the plot points do repeat. But always, if you want more specific things about a specific series, whether that's from 2004 or 1973, always feel free to do your own research. The Cutie Honey manga ran in the Weekly Shonen Champion magazines from October 1973 to April 1974, with different shorter iterations of the series being published in different magazines by different creative teams. These different creative teams often stay true to Go Nagai's source material, often word for word, but sometimes omitted characters, jump storylines, ended on cliffhangers, or added new characters and enemies for Honey to face. Ultimately, in 1985, Nagai republished the Cutie Honey manga into a single volume and did it again in 1992. Cutie Honey would go on to have several manga adaptations spanning from the mid-1990s to 2016, such as Cutie Honey Flash in 1997 and Cutie Honey Seed, which that one was written by Go Nagai, but not illustrated by him. There are so many examples of manga adaptations for Cutie Honey. But I am getting a little ahead of myself, so let's go back to 1973. Toy Animation produced the anime for Cutie Honey while the manga was actually still being drawn. It ran simultaneously to the anime in October 1973 to March 1974 with 25 episodes. In order to adapt the manga into an anime series, much of the content had to be toned down, such as the gore, the edgy humor, the lesbian undertones between some characters, and she shifted 
the feel of the series from science fiction to more of a magical girl series, feeling it would connect with audiences better that way. And when Cutie Honey premiered, it did have statistically good ratings. Enter New Cutie Honey in 1994, where the plot of this one is set 100 years after the original 1973 Cutie Honey anime. Honey Kisadagi, who is still an android, has lost her memories of being the heroine Cutie Honey and also has lost the ability to transform. She does eventually regain her abilities and her memories and continues being a heroine. New Cutie Honey has eight 25 minute episodes. And also this is the first Cutie Honey series that I had watched. I watched it in college. And New Cutie Honey was produced by Studio Junio, Trans Arts, and the famous Ashi Productions, who is famously known for its production of the magical series Princess Miki Mino in 1982. ADV Films produced the English dub where Nagai was very hands on with the selection of voice actors, particularly for Honey. The role of Honey ended up going to Jessica Calveo, which you may recognize her voice in other titles such as Attack on Titan, One Piece, and Life Lessons of Yuramichi Onisan. The reception of the anime was interesting to say the least, from the guy being praised for New Cutie Honey and calling it his best work. One critic used the phrase amusing nonsense, pointing out how Nagai does not shy away from strangeness and also the use of bright colors and it clearly has been influenced by American superheroes. However, there were critics such as Susan J. Napier who believe Cutie Honey sent mixed messages to its audience, stating that Honey is a strong hero but cannot exist without being overly sexualized, such as her transformation scenes or when she gets injured or seeing other characters oogling over her in her private moments, often alluding to the anime being borderline pornographic. The fan service in this anime exists definitely to cater toward a male audience, with Cutie Honey being a shonen, that makes sense. But also remember, shonen is supposed to be aimed at young adolescent boys meaning children. There were also critics who stated that this show was for folks who were particularly looking for a fan service action-based show that also may slightly have some intelligence to it. And there were others that felt that Honey felt a little bit hollow as a character and wished to learn more about her and her past and her likes and interests and things like that. Which is interesting because again, in this rendition, Honey is an android. So would she have a past? Past being created by Dr. Kesadagi? I don't know. Now there was one critic named Sandra Dozier who praised Cutie Honey for its lesbian portrayal of one of Honey's enemies, but did feel the story jumped around way too much and it was kind of hard to follow. But you know, it was funny in some instances, which is a very fair critique. Cutie Honey Flash was produced by Toei Animation in 1997 and was also produced by many of the same animators that worked on Sailor Moon, Sailor Stars, which by the time Cutie Honey Flash premiered February 15th, 1997, Sailor Stars had actually just finished its runtime by February 8th. People have often made comments that Cutie Honey Flash looks very similar to Sailor Moon Sailor Stars, or people have wrongfully called it a ripoff, when actually the similarities arose more than likely due to the overlap in animation staffers between the productions coming out from the same studio within literally a week of each other. And also, we know that nobody does animated rose petals like Toei Animation. It's like their staple. <laughs> So of course they all look the same. Cutie Honey Flash brings much more color and vibrancy to the look of Cutie Honey, which feels like an attempt to breathe some new life into the franchise. In this series, Honey Kisadagi was given a rival named Misty Honey, who also possesses the ability to transform and proclaim to be Honey's twin sister. But everything isn't always what they seem to be. In the same year, 1997, Bandai hosted a survey with a section including favorite characters. In this survey, Cutie Honey ranked first with girls aged from three to five and girls aged from six to eight. While Shonen's target demographic are young boys, which Cutie Honey has remained under the Shonen demographic since 1973, Cutie Honey Flash was actually labeled under Shoujo, which aims to target young adolescent girls. 1997's Cutie Honey Flash, in a sense, was doing its job and reaching the target demographic it was aimed at. Cutie Honey and New Cutie Honey definitely had an impact on young girls also, but I wondered, 
always wondered if the results would be the same if this survey was done back in 1973. There was a three episode OVA produced by Gainax and Toei Animation called Re Cutie Honey that coincides with the 2004 live action film Cutie Honey. This series mostly follows Honey Kisadagi, who was created by Dr. Kisadagi to be a vigilante and fight the evil Panther Claws. There are many references in the OVA to Sailor Moon, Lupin the Third, and even Kill Bill. But those references make a ton of sense, being that in 2004, the live action of Cutie Honey, while being a watered down version of the 1973 manga, leaned into more campy and over the top and very interesting CGI that was definitely a product of its time. <laughs> However, remember when I said that Cutie Honey, while its origins are in Shonen, but are now kind of shifting in the shoujo? This three episode OVA definitely leaned more into the shoujo category versus the shonen. Many of the issues with the live action was not only the incoherent story, thus driving the need for the OVA re Cutie Honey, which was made to kind of make sense of the live action, but was also the issue again of fan service, especially since the show was aimed at young audiences. But one thing about the 2004 live action, the costumes were on point. In 2007, there was a TV live action show called Cutie Honey, but this live action switched things up a bit. This show focused on three transforming girls with very different personalities, with Go Nagai himself playing Dr. Kisaragi. During the day, Honey Kisaragi is a high school student, but by moonlight, she fights the Panther Claws. During one of her midnight escapades, she meets Miki Saltome and Yuki Kimochi. And during her several clashes with the Panther Claws, she learns that they also have the ability to transform. As their bond deepens, they all form a team to take on the Panther Claw Secret Society. The show seemed to be very well received. And yes, once again, many elements from the manga, such as the fan service and the gore, were toned down. The big thing that received so much positive feedback was the new spin on the show focusing on more than one magical girl. That was the thing that really made it a hit. In 2016, Cutie Honey Tears premiered and it had the most compelling story, I think, out of all the live action takes on Cutie Honey. Dr. Kisaragi, played by Go Nagai, creates an android with, with human-like qualities, but still being artificial, using his deceased daughter as the basis of the android's mind and soul. That android obviously being Honey. The world that Honey is created into has a strange airborne virus that is causing the male population to decrease. AI is being used and weaponized by the rich to keep regular citizens poor and destitute, while they just keep getting richer and richer. Honey is brought to the Earth's surface, but at the cost of Dr. Kisadaki's life. And not wanting his death to be in vain and becoming acutely aware of the suffering of the people, Honey teams up with journalist Seji Hayami and resistance leader Kazuhito Irakai to fight against the oppressors of the world. I think this movie is trying to send us a message. In 2017, Go Nagai celebrated his 50th year of being a manga artist and announced the fifth animated project of the Cutie Honey series, Cutie Honey Universe. The show itself premiered April 2018, following the similar plot of all of the previous Cutie Honey variants. In this go, Honey te teams up with the PCIS, the Panther Claw's Criminal Investigative Services. Yes, I know. After her father is killed by the Panther Claw organization, unaware that that the enemy is much closer than she thinks. Like in the original manga, Honey is an android and attends an all-girls Catholic school. Honey Kusuragi herself and her transformation looks all receive a cool, colorful upgrade, which if you want to see them yourself and check out some of the episodes, it is available on High Dive right now. So there were many Cutie Honey stage plays that also took place from as early as 1997 to as recently as June 2021. I also think it's really cool that in 2003, there was a live action stage play in the Bandai Museum of all places. How cool is that? And there are also various Cutie Honey video games, which in some of the games, Cutie Honey actually gets different transformations, such as Fantasy Night Honey, which is a wrestler, which I think that is so cool. I think it'd be really cool to add Cutie Honey to a modern fighting game. What do you think? Go Nagai's legacy is an interesting one. He began his career after he fell very ill in college and believed based on his symptoms that he had colon cancer. His goal was to be remembered and to leave his mark on history in some kind of way. And that's exactly what he sought out to do. Oh, by the way, it turns out he didn't have cancer at all. 
But by the time he found that out, his hard work had already caught the attention of Shitaro Ishinomori, the creator of Cyborg 009, and who kind of became a mentor to Nagai and helped him get his start. At age 19, Nagai's trial manga, like the test one before he made his official debut, was actually a violent sci-fi piece about a ninja that laid the groundwork for 1978's Kuro no Shishi, which then also inspired 1992's Black Lion OAV. <laughs> but this trial trial manga went from three pages to 20 pages and it just got really long and was taking much more investment than expected and was ultimately left as a draft obviously until 1978. So Nagai's debut manga in 1967 was Kawakashi's Polikichi, a one-shot gag humor type of comedy historical drama about a policeman during the Edo period. And gag humor short manga was what Nagai would do for a little bit until 1968. Hidenshi Gaiken was published in 1968 and was later adapted into four live action films and a TV series drama. It won't be going into the plot as it's incredibly violent and once again has those overt sexual themes that again are promoted towards children. And this one is also a shonen. The guy has mentioned that as a child he would read Playboy magazines, which is wildly inappropriate for a child to have been reading that. And he also used the word harinchi, which means scandal in the title of the manga because he knew that that word was often used to promote adult type movies and thought mixing it with a publication that was aimed at children would be funny. I missed the joke. All of the scandals and blowback around this manga were very similar to Cutie Honey. And with this manga and the creation and success of Cutie Honey, got Nagai essentially coined as the creator of Echi Manga, which again heavily depends on sexual oriented humor. Something I am too ace for. Throughout his career, he would shift from shonen magical girl type of anime series to shonen sci fi comedy and horror type manga and anime, which I strongly believe that's where his true creative passion were from the beginning because remember the cutie honey manga despite its vulgarity and fan service had more sci-fi themes than magical girl themes and in its anime production was shifted to be more magical girl so it would connect more with audiences throughout his career while cutie honey was a success it did receive harsh criticisms for its vulgarity and borderline pornographic fan service i want to reiterate that shonen's target demographic are young adolescent boys and while it's harrowing to be credited with creating the first shonen with a female lead, according to Nagai, it's also ironic that it took fan service and gag comedy within his formula to make that a success. Now, from having watched some Cutie Honey shows, at least the ones that I could get my hands on, I can see how it can be argued that Honey Kisaragi slash Cutie Honey is never sexualized by her own volition. However, the circumstances surrounding her certainly do. And you as an audience member are definitely aware of that. And remember, with the exception of one or two productions, Honey is a child. And why conflate hyper eroticism and children? It's a bit strange. I don't personally see where the humor or funny stuff is about it, but that's just me. It makes me wonder if the queer representation in some renditions of Cutie Honey was from a place of genuine representation or fetishization. Who knows? If you haven't caught on by now, I personally don't like fan service. I think that it is a cheap trick and crutch in storytelling that can distract from either a lack of substance in content or distract you from great storytelling when it's not even necessary. Hi, editing me here. I wanted to expand my thoughts on the whole fan service thing because I, it's not that I particularly don't like fan service. I really dislike in how majority of fan service is portrayed, particularly when it comes to young girls in very sexualized scenarios. I think that fan service can be done in a very tasteful way. Take Jujutsu Kaisen, for example, like when it comes to Nanami or Gojo, who are grown men with jobs who just also happen to be hot and really care about the people around them. To me, that is also a form of fan service. And to me, I find that very attractive. However, in majority of fan service depictions that's aimed at young men or it's aimed at children or sometimes have the audience of adults and it involves like a 10 year old girl or you know a girl that's supposed to be like 1000 years old but is definitely in the body of like a child that's weird it's very weird because why can't the person of interest just be an adult <laughs> 
And I understand that not all anime and not all things are aimed at adults. I understand that anime has a full wide audience with various age ranges and things like that. But I will say anime is made by adults. So why are you putting these childlike female characters in like these overly sexualized borderline pornographic scenarios? Like, who is that for? I don't know. I don't know. That's just, I don't know. It does. It doesn't make me feel good. Just, I don't know. It doesn't feel right. Is there a way to tastefully do fan service? Absolutely. I don't know, though, where that line is when it comes to kids. And I really don't want to explore that. I think that's very weird. And in this category, I am not talking about like the type of anime where it's like a shoujo anime. They're both in high school and it's a coming of age story and they're learning to love each other and learning more about themselves. I'm not talking about things like that. I hope we have like enough common ground and common sense to like know the difference of the things that I'm talking about. Fan service that I personally find tasteful. Again, not to me. Go Joe. Do that. Even Toji, who's homeless and so good looking hi super editing me here sorry i can't show myself i'm a little indisposed when i am recording this but i wanted to add a another aspect of this because when go nagai actually was made aware of all of the blowback and harsh criticism that he was getting for his works he was actually genuinely surprised he was surprised by the hyper criticism because one he didn't think it was about him personally he thought it was just maybe in how he presented his work and also he felt that he wasn't doing anything different than what his cohorts were doing in the industry which is an interesting conclusion to draw being that a whole subcategory of anime and manga was created because of him that didn't exist before so he clearly wasn't doing the same thing that his counterparts were doing but that's neither here nor there i want to be very sensitive when bringing up this subject especially when it involves you know graphic content and children especially with everything that's going on with the quiet on set documentary this type of censorship and what media should be when it's geared toward children is not just a japanese anime conversation it, it's honestly a global content conversation that i think we really should have because let's take american animated television shows and things that we watch as a child and then when we watch them as an adult there are definitely adult themes in situations where i'm just like ooh, why was i exposed to that <laughs> looking at like ren and stimpy and Adventure Time, Spongebob, like it's honestly everywhere. So, you know, when we talk about like censorship and, you know, what is appropriate for, you know, making children's content or just content that's geared at children or adolescents, I just really think that we need to have like a wider conversation on it and also have people who are very, very well equipped to have those conversations lead them. Now, I don't want to make it seem like there shouldn't be any content out there for children and adolescents that definitely challenge them or be about coming of age stories or things that have to deal with the body and like the changes you're going through. I definitely don't think that. I think that that content is so important. Like for me, for example, a piece of work that I was exposed to in middle school was John Green's The Fault in Our Stars. And that book is about children with cancer, but it's hilarious. And it really presents a lot of like changes and feelings and falling in love for the first time. Like the way that it is presented, like John Green doesn't really hold your hand when it comes to, you know, dealing with themes like that. And he really puts a lot of faith in you as the reader to, you know, take a lot of those things home with you. An anime example would be Fruits Basket. Now there are some relationships in Fruits Baskets that are definitely um, illegal, <laughs> but I actually watched Fruits Basket at a time where I had lost somebody very special to me in my life and you know seeing that toru had you know lost her mother and pe a lot of people actually had lost family members in fruits basket but seeing it how they all deal and cope with grief and move on in life like that was something that i definitely needed and those stories are important it's just i think it's in the methodology of how we present those themes to children that's also not dehumanizing to you know groups of people. And again, I am looking at all of this analysis through a 2024 lens. And I also through an American lens, I know that like my singular experience is not the experience of everybody globally. I really want to encourage you all to read the Frenzy Metamorphosis, the body and Japanese pornographic animation it gives historical context of things that were happening in Japan as the development of animation and anime happened across, you know, the decades, but also talks about like how the human body is portrayed in terms of sexuality 
and gender and gender bias and social identity when it relates to anime and how you know the images that are borderline pornographic and male and female bodies and what the consequences of that could be down the line it's a very good read and i have it linked below in my description box anywho that's just my thoughts but this is all i'm going to talk about fan service because i hate these type of conversations it just makes me very uncomfortable especially in the realm of anime and i also like want to set a serious boundary with my content because people have sent me requests to do deep dives on very vulgar very particularly gross type of animes even if they are macho girls it's just like overly sexual and it just makes me very uncomfortable i understand that these characters are fake I also see that it is a slippery slope. And if your art is essentially that, it makes me not want to trust you. That's because where's your inspiration coming from? <laughs> is Gonagai a trailblazer? Yes. Did he create the first shonen with a female lead? According to him, yes. Is he talented? Also, yes. But is he a human with flaws and a very weird FBI open up sense of humor? Also, yes. Cutie Honey's impact on the magical girl genre cannot be denied. Its influence is everywhere. Gona Guy's reputation is essentially about breaking taboos and pushing boundaries of the manga industry, especially when it comes to things under the censorship umbrella. If you want a good Gona Guy manga or show without the perversions of things mentioned before and get a sense of the deep storyteller that Nagai is, I'd recommend Devilman. But me major 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 warning it is gory it is violent and has a lot of horror elements so if that's not your thing then devil man is not for you and i'm not here to demonize cutie honey or go guy i don't want to come across that way but i do have to inform you since this is a deep dive like i said before cutie honey's impact on anime especially the impact that cutie honey has had with magical girls particularly is undeniable we see it in the complex transformation sequences or having the main protagonist have multiple transformations which is really cool and a lot of that started with cutie honey and also the musicality of cutie honey it's not just the opening and ending theme songs that are great it is honestly the musical score without cutie honey in all of the series that are good now the original opening theme song is not in cutie honey universe due to some copyright issues with toei animation and it's also the reason why i'm not going to play it in this youtube video at all but if you do get your hands on the cutie honey books or get to watch the tv shows or any of the variations of the anime that exist you will see just visually and also musically just the impact that cutie honey has had on magical girls and just anime period but tell me have you ever watched cutie honey or any of its variants let me know down in the comments and if you like this content consider giving me a five star rating if you're listening to the podcast and if you're watching here on youtube please remember to subscribe and give the video a thumbs up i am so close to youtube partner i could taste it help your girl out please patrons get early access to bonus content so if you'd like to join us we welcome you also the same thing over on coffee thank you so much for your time today and you as always have a magical day bye <laughs>